Hi everyone, Sandman here. Here is the next video from the Toronto Domestic Violence Symposium. This video is of Vernon Beck speaking about the issues people face with child services, as well as law enforcement and the shelter system. This speaker's presentation is absolutely jam-packed with tons of material. So enjoy the video, and cheers. Well, thank you, Attila. Uh, certainly, it's a pleasure to be here today to speak on the issue of domestic violence. As Attila said, I'm the uh, person who started Canada Court Watch about 19 years ago. It's a, uh, normally not in our area, uh, domestic violence. Uh, our organization normally focuses on the family court issues. Uh, we have a lot of children's aid society cases and we advocate for accountability and transparency. And over the 19 years that I've been advocating as a child and family advocate, uh, as I said, I have interviewed uh, many children, uh, parents. I get calls from the, every profession has called me at one point. I've even had uh, judges call me off the record to provide information to me that they didn't even want the other judges to know they were providing to me. I have had lawyers call me. And uh, certainly when I started this 19 years ago, I, I had no idea. Like most people, I believed that you know there was a justice system, there's a court system. We have police. I had a few friends who were police officers. Um, I was fairly naive back then. But certainly over the years and the work that I've done with Canada Court Watch, uh, my opinion and my uh, is certainly different than it was many years ago. And certainly at this point in time, I can say I've seen enough, I've interviewed enough children, I've reviewed enough court documents, I have gone into enough court cases, and uh, I am a member, I am a journalist, I'm a member of the Journalist Union for a number of years. Uh, just last year I sat and spoke to one of the Supreme Court Justices up in Ottawa, uh, it was only probably about a month and a half ago I was uh, given a, an order from the Superior Court judge to represent a minor in a child protection matter, which is extremely rare. You know, the Children's Aid Society fought vehemently in that for about two and a half hours to keep Canada Court Watch out of that courtroom, but the judge ordered that I represent a minor in the case because of my experience over the years. So normally, domestic violence hasn't been one of our focus. We really don't get into research, uh, things like that, that other people may get into. But in the, I guess in our, in our travels and in the work that I've done, it keeps coming up over and over again. Now, there is a uh, video presentation that I'm going to go through here. And uh, that is the Canada Court Watch website. That's our Facebook page. I think it shows about 4,000 members on there. Um, we, we get a lot of traffic. We've, we're fairly ranked high in Google. And believe me, I get, uh, we get an average of probably about five to six phone calls every day come into our organization from children, uh, kids in care, uh, from mothers, uh, victims of domestic violence. Uh, I could go on and on and on. Now, focusing on the issue of domestic violence, I can say right now that what I've seen over the 19 years is I can say that the domestic violence has evolved into an industry. It's not just an issue, it's not just a problem, it has developed into an industry where I see a lot of people making a lot of money. And there are many vested interests in maintaining this. And this is based on my 19 years of, uh, of experience in all aspects of going in. Here's a, a, a picture that you may see on the internet and it's on uh, some of our materials, but basically what we're seeing today is families being destroyed by the system, whether it's the family court system, child protection system, or other agencies, but it just seems that people are getting drawn into a system. Domestic violence is one of the cards that draws people into this system. It gets them into it. If there's a little argument, husband and wife, spouses have an argument, they get sucked into this system, which ultimately, in many cases, destroys them, destroys their children, and just 
utter destruction. Some of the uh, some of the people that we see that benefit or are part of this industry are law enforcement agencies, uh, women shelters, victim services, which usually work closely with uh, police services, uh, domestic violence counseling services, and the legal system, lawyers, judges, and court-related services. There's all a vested interest in there. And uh, a lot of these agencies seem to push and, and keep this industry growing. There always seems to be requests for more money. Uh, many times you'll see lawyers are requesting more money. The legal aid, they want more money. Everybody's wanting more money, more judges, more this, more that. It, it, they're trying to expand the, uh, the business. So I was asked here today to, uh, to kind of get into some real life experiences of people, children, and incidents that I personally have seen over the many years that I've been involved in, as an advocate. So I'm going to cover some of them, which will give some real, I guess, a taste of what is really going on to some real people. I'm not talking from a statistical point of view, but from real life. I'm going to talk about the, the issue about the police. Okay, usually domestic violence, one of the first things that happens is the police are called in. Spouses get into an argument, uh, the police end up at the door, and that's quite often one of the places where it starts. Now, I don't know how clear that uh, photo up there, but this father that I've put a, a picture up on, to give you an example, uh, and again, these are pictures, photos I've taken personally. I've personally met with him, We've reviewed court documents. His ex-wife alleged to the Toronto Police that she saw a, a work van from the company he works for driving down Danforth Avenue, a few vehicles behind her. Now Danforth is a major road in Toronto. It was within about three kilometers of where he lived. She just called the police and alleged that she saw a van and, who, and she said he was inside driving it behind her somewhere. He got home, he didn't, knew nothing about this, but got home, the police came, he was handcuffed, arrested, and he was uh, put in jail for four days. While he was in jail for four days, the company he worked for fired him because he had no way of contacting the company. He had a company van. He couldn't get the van back, so he was fired from his work, and he had a good job, probably about $50,000 a year. So he was fired. Finally, when he got out and let his bosses know, well, it was too late. But the interesting thing is that while he was in jail, the wife, his wife already had a plan to leave the country. She took his two children. Now, they were living apart. They were separated, but she took the children to link up with a boyfriend that she had met over the Internet and she fled down into the U.S. So it was clearly a setup. She got the arrest, got him knocked out of commission, whatever, so she could abscond with the children out of the country. And it took him about, I think it was about three or four years to find the children again. So there's something where a man, and he's a good man, if you ever met the guy, he's as peaceful as you would ever want to, of a man you'd ever want to meet quiet, reserved, hardworking, but that's what happened to him based on one telephone call, no evidence, no nothing. I helped him find the kids a few years later. We put out a, uh, a fax campaign to every school board in the United States, in the southern United States, and within three days after we sent out a picture of the two kids and the mother, the boy, her boyfriend called me from Texas and pleaded with us to if we could stop the faxes to the school because someone at the school had identified the children. But this is uh, quite common. Here's another case. I'm not sure how this picture showed up, uh, but that is a picture of a 14-year-old boy. Again, I've met with him. We had pictures taken of him. 
he was being abused by his mother, physically abused. The mother was smoking marijuana with her boyfriend. They were doing drugs in the house. He wanted to go live with his father, who was living in a stable environment. And when he went over there, you know, the mother called the Children's Aid Society and alleged that the boy was in, living in a dangerous, you know, not in a good environment. Based on that one phone call, the police were called, and the boy wasn't even at his dad's house when this picture was taken. He was at his aunt's house in the summertime, sleeping, like it was like about 8 o'clock in the morning. The police came in without a warrant. They walked into the house. They went down into the basement rec room and the bedroom in the basement where this boy was sleeping at 8 o'clock in the morning. They pulled this young boy out of bed, and again, no warrant to go in the house. They forced their way in. They handcuffed him. And if you look at the picture, his feet are, have been shackled as well. He was handcuffed hauled out of a, his family's family relative's home that was safe in a middle-income home, good, good family. He was hauled out into the OPP, no arrest warrant, no nothing. All because of an allegation by his mother that he was in an unsafe place. Nobody checked it out. It was just an allegation. Luckily, the boy called me. He was told by the police, uh, you could call a lawyer if you want. He immediately called me. I had about a five-minute conversation with the officer, and I said, you know, officer, you didn't, you, you arrested this boy without a warrant. And I said, you know what, uh, you've just, uh, you're going to be in big trouble. I asked the officer, I said, how long have you been on the force? He said, well, about five years. I said, well, your, your career is going to be toast if you don't let that kid out right now. And I think about 60, days, 60, minutes, 60 seconds later, they had the kid out of a jail cell at the, court, at the police station. The police are using violence against young children based on simply an allegation and the Children's Aid Society just coming in and coming to a conclusion. And uh, this is as much domestic violence as would a couple if they got into a fight or family members. And the police are, are doing this to children and they're instilling a distrust of police and the administration of justice as whole, in a whole amongst uh, a young generation of, of Canadians. Here's another father that I personally interviewed, and I interviewed his children as well. He had uh, teenage boys. He describes how his wife had a drinking problem. One night, she got, in, she got totally drunk came at him. He tried to go and protect himself by going into the powder room. There's a small powder room. You know, small powder rooms, they're usually about three feet wide. She broke the hinges off the door, and the door kind of, you know, went against him, but because there was a wall there, he was able to hold the door back and keep her from getting in. Basically, she pounded on the door, but the door was busted right off, both hinges. She busted it right off. When she eventually couldn't get him, uh, she fell uh, asleep, went to the bedroom and f fell asleep drunk. And he called the police. And this was just in Oakville, actually not too far from where he lived. The police came over and he said the first thing that they did is two male police officers surrounded him in the kitchen and a female officer went into the bedroom where mom had passed out and was asking her, are you okay, honey? Did he hurt you? Okay. Are you okay? Automatic assumption. And I interviewed the kids as well. And they, they too disclosed how abusive their mother was, that she was drunk half the time, that she would abuse them, she would abuse the father, all kinds of this. Was she ever charged? No. I think she eventually, I think the last I heard from them is that eventually she got caught drunk driving and, and was picked up that way. But was she ever charged for all the uh, assault on their children, on her husband? It was all swept under the, uh, the carpet. So again, because uh, I'm only going to cover certain situations, but the, I, I get these stories all the time. 
this situation. Now, violence by the mothers or by uh, women is ignored. And I get it by children as well. Women's shelters. Let me tell you a few of the stories uh, I've run across involving women's shelters. Okay. And let me just say, I've had generally the experiences that people tell me about are bad. But at the same time, I can tell you that there have been a couple of women's shelters that actually have contacted me to help some of the women clients in the shelters. They know that we do provide some help, uh, sincere help to some of the uh, mothers that are there. But here's a little girl I interviewed. I got a call from her mother who was in the shelter. And the mother called me up. She was furious one day. She says, I'm furious. She says, I, I stayed at the shelter. She says, I, was, I wasn't really abused, but I had just been told to go there because we had an argument with my husband one time. And she says, I'm furious about what they were doing there. But this little girl and her younger brother were told that part of what they do with children when they're at the women's shelter is that they have a children's program. You know, all the ch kids come in and the workers have a nice little children's program for them. Well, this little girl almost cried because she said she was gone. She, when she went into this children's program, the mothers weren't allowed to accompany the kids. They were told that the kids had to go by themselves. When they got into this children's program, she told me that they were shown a video of what this little girl said were daddies beating up mummies. The mother was furious when she heard this, when her daughter told her this. I certainly became uh, furious as well. I mean, it's just terrible. It was in my own community to have this type of, this is indoctrination of children into this belief. So she was told that when she got married and got older, that her boyfriend or her husband was going to abuse her like these men in the video did. Terribly wrong. So this is just some of the stories, personal stories that I have run across. Here's another woman. Again, these are pictures and interviews that I've taken. Some of, this is on the internet. You can actually go on our, on our video website. You can see this woman speak. Again, another woman in a woman's shelter came out, disgusted as the way she treated. She said, she told me, she said, she witnessed children being abused by their mothers in the women's shelter. She saw women fight and beat each other up in the women's shelter. And she said that before you were allowed to stay at the women's shelter, you had to sign a document stating that you would not disclose anything that you saw in, while you were a resident in the women's shelter or you would have to leave. And you were not allowed to keep a copy of that document. Crazy. So again, she was telling me, she was also told that Quite often, there's donations. A lot of communities donate to women's shelters. They have, usually, some of these shelters, they have rooms where they're full of donations, furniture, and stuff like that. She was told that if she wanted to get the pick of the donations, and I have it on video, she said that she would have to engage in lesbianism with some of the shelter workers. She was even referred to a lawyer in Toronto who I believe has died since that time, but who is a lesbian. And she said, if you, if you want to get favors in here, you have to do the workers' favors. So there's some definitely terrible things going on in some of these women's shelters. I have another woman on video, I don't have them all here, but who told me the same thing. She was basically said that, you know, you better do some favors for the workers here, otherwise you're not going to get treated fairly. So, moving on from women's shelters, domestic violence, or I should say, uh, crown attorneys and victim services were some of the experiences and, and people that I talked to about. That's another segment of the domestic violence industry that's there. Usually when the police are called, victim services get involved with the victim, supposedly to help them 
to support them and to help them get on with their lives. But from, there are some good instances and some good examples where people are helped, but there is a dark side to that as well. I printed out or copied a, a letter here, and I've got some copies uh, in my briefcase that I can leave on the table for people to look at. This is a letter that this woman, who was a supposedly a victim, and if you, if you do take a minute to, to read it, she basically describes that she, her and her husband got into a TIFF. They did not become physical. They did not touch each other. There was no physical altercation of each other. Nothing except they just started calling each other names and uh, she said she was going to call 911 on them, teach them a lesson. And of course his response is, well, go right ahead. You want to teach me a lesson? Go right ahead. Well, that's pretty typical of two spouses, I suppose. They want to make a point. Well, so she did. She went and called 911. And if you look at some of the, the comments she made there, basically she said she never realized the horror that was unleashed upon her and her family after she made that phone call. And I'm not going to read it because the... Uh, you know, the, I guess the way with the technical difficulties we had with the presentation, I wouldn't be able to go through it, so you can glance quickly at it. But there's the second page of it. There is uh, how the police officers told her. I think it's in there. They, t they tell her, go cash your husband's check-in and take the money. Basically telling her, treat him like a nobody. So right from the very beginning, the officers are, are treating him as if he's a nobody. She doesn't need him. Get rid of him. She, they even arrested him before they even asked her what went on. And this is a letter she wrote to the Attorney General of Ontario. And uh, there's the third part of the letter. Much of the same thing. It just goes on. She goes on to talk about the, the damage and the bias. And she talks about victim services, how victim services uh, told her she doesn't need a man. Okay? You know, what do you need a husband for? Get out on your own. And this is the kind of story I probably have two or three dozen letters like this, very similar. I think I had one lady just last last year down here off the Don Valley in Toronto. Similar situation. Heard her husband got into an argument. She went outside the apartment building. One of her neighbors come up who happened to live on the same floor, happened to be a female police officer. Oh, honey, what are you doing out here? Oh, my husband and I got in a fight. Well, come into my apartment. The police officer, the female police, off-duty female police officer takes her to apartment. Oh yeah, you must be abused. He's not supposed to be doing that. Before you know it, the, the off-duty police officer had called down to her. The other officers are up. They got the guy arrested and unleash all hell on the family. So this seems to be the, the general, what I see over my years is that these minor incidences now are being blown out of proportion, deliberately blown out of proportion by a general bias by these agencies. And I think this is the, probably the last part of the letter here. But again, this woman expresses how she's worried. What is this going to do to my son when he grows up, if this is the way they're treating his father? And I've got copies of the letter if anybody wants. They uh, get a hard copy of it afterwards. But one of, the things, one of the things I find repeatedly when, when we run across these instances where mothers are quite often calling us, the pattern seems to be the same. There's an arrest based on flimsiest, no evidence, just allegations. And from there, the family is ripped apart and they're, they're coerced to turn against their partner you know, sometimes it's a, a husband against the wife, but the pattern remains the same. 
the focus of the authority seems to be we want to get a conviction. We want to get somebody in jail. We want to rack up another statistic. That appears to be the pattern that's going on in almost every case. And what they do is they try to get the party to plead guilty to a crime that they did not do. They say, well, we'll give you a plea bargain. You can get back to see your kids. You and your wife can get to see each other again, but plead guilty to this, you know, and we'll let you off. And of course, many people fall prey to it because the first time they talk to a lawyer, they're told, well, uh, let's get a $5,000 or $10,000 deposit to get you started. And then they're faced with this offer. If you plead guilty, we'll get back. And they don't realize the consequences. <coughs> Anyways, I'll touch on the issue of children's aid, you know, how they come in with domestic violence. Generally, when the police get a call for domestic violence, usually one of the first agencies that are automatically called now is the Children's Aid Society. They almost have a protocol between the two organizations is that they get called. Now, not only do, does a couple have the, uh, the crown attorney, they got the lawyers, they got criminal lawyers, uh, police, they got all these people to deal with. Now, the Child Protection Agency comes in. Now they got another level of intrusion into their families. And in most cases, even if there's no guilt, uh, in many cases, the children's aid agencies will insist that the spouses separate and that the children are unable to see the spouse who is alleged to have been the perpetrator. In most cases, it's the fathers, but I have spoken to mothers as well. Haven't been able to see their children because they, they, you know, they uh, got angry, lost their temper one afternoon. And, and uh, so there are mothers who get, get stuck as well. So again, and what the Children's Aid Society quite often do, they will say that if you allow the children to speak to the offender, or if you talk to the offender, we're going to apprehend your children. That's a common threat that they use. So here you have kids separated from one of the parents. You've got the parent who has the children terrified now to let the kids speak to the other parent the, the strategy between the Crown Attorney, the police, the Children's Aid Society, I think it says all right there, it's to isolate, separate, divide, to terrorize, basically to separate that family and get them in a position where uh, they're vulnerable. Now you've got a single mom, can't afford to pay the rent. Dad's not there to help uh, watch the kids. Uh, they're going crazy with court and stuff like that. Kids are starting to act out. Now you've got Children's Aid Society moving in to go even further. And as far as, again, I talked about the, the benefits of what these, this industry, Children's Aid Society, the more cases they have open, the more money they get, the more intervention there is, everybody makes more money. That happens to be the, I, I don't think too many of us can afford one of these cars there. It's a Hummer, pretty expensive vehicle, but that happens to be a Children's Aid Society worker's car. And that picture was taken in the parking lot of the Children's Aid Society. So if you want to know where your tax dollars are going, uh, there's big money being with Children's Aid. Let's talk about the lawyers. And until, I don't know, you keep an eye on my time for me. Okay. Let's talk about the lawyers, uh, their involvement. And again, believe me, I've got friends who are lawyers. I work with lawyers. I think there's at least one lawyer coming on here today, Walter Fox, who, very honorable gentleman. Uh, not all lawyers are bad. I'm saying that. Oh, what did I do here? I'm not saying lawyers that are rats, but here's a cover of McLean's uh, magazine a few years ago. Uh, all I can say is that look, there are a, too many lawyers that are doing things in this domestic violence industry to knowingly 
hurt children and families. I've had mothers call me and tell me that they were told by their lawyers to fabricate false allegations against their husbands to get the upper hand in family court. Some of them got the courage to come forth and say, yeah, they didn't think it was right, you know, that this was wrong. In some of these situations, some of the mothers have said, and when they have tried to tell the truth, you know, maybe uh, their husband was arrested wrongly just because they had an argument. They are threatened to be arrested if they come and tell the truth. The Crown Attorney will tell them, as well as the Children's Aid Society workers, that if you come forth now and reveal what really happened, we are going to either arrest, charge you for public mischief, we are going to arrest you, or the Children's Aid Society are going to take away your children. When there's any thought that the, that the alleged victim may be coming forth with a different story or the truth, now suddenly they're going, they're going to attack her to scare her. I, I see this repeatedly. And that seems to be the tactic that the, the law enforcement and people like that do. Even some mothers have told me that their lawyers will, told them that they will quit being their lawyers if they go back and uh, recant and make it difficult for the other agencies to continue their relentless pursuit of the family. There's no doubt I've been in lawyers. We all know that false allegations are the weapon of first choice in court and they're made way too often. I think it was Ju Justice Mary Lou Bonotto, she's a judge in Ontario, who actually at a seminar stated that a, few, a number of years back. She said that false allegations are rampant in family courts here in, in Canada and especially in Ontario where she's from. And if anybody's been following any of the news in the last year, uh, it was just last, uh, just last spring, I met with Supreme Court Justice Thomas Cromwell up in Ottawa, up at Carleton University, and met with him and had an interesting chat and talked to him about some of the issues relating to family law. And about two or three months after I had uh, talked to him, you'll notice there is a report that he released to the Chief Justice in Canada, and he too has said that the family court system in Canada is in deep problems and that Canadians are losing respect for the administration of justice in this country. The, uh, the Ontario Chief Justice as well said the same thing. I think it was back, maybe it might have been just as, as late as November, December of just last year, said the same thing. The family court system is broke and we have a serious problem here. <clears throat> So some of these situations that I run across are kind of the tip of the iceberg. So lawyers have had a play. Judges, everybody knows. It's no secret anymore. There is a problem with the judges in there. And this is what they do. They literally strip away, in most cases, strip away children from fathers. They, uh, everybody knows the court's biased. Every, most lawyers I speak to all know it but they're not gonna say it publicly. It's no secret anymore, but nobody for political reasons comes out to say it. You know, they'll say the system has experienced problems, that the system is kind of broken, but you'll, very seldom will you get uh, somebody who's a professional stating that there is a problem with gender bias in the court system today. You know, generally judges won't say it, generally the lawyers won't say it, some will speak out and say it, but there's literally a fear within those in the system themselves to speak out. There's no doubt about that. There's a fear. Sometimes when lawyers get near retirement or they have retired, they will speak out because they've got nothing to lose at that point. But every day, you see, I get calls every day 
uh, basically fathers being taken, stripped out of the lives of children. There are some mothers too, but the statistics, and I'm sure other people have uh, statistics that I don't have, or you know, I'm not at the tip of my tongue here, that, that would reinforce that. This is going on all the time. Again, here's a photo out of the public realm. This demonstrates, this, this is a picture of what the public are feeling about the family court system today. This is what's going on. And I see it when I've gone into court. Being a journalist, I have gone into court. I have sat in cases. Because one thing as a journalist I'm allowed to do is I can sit in most cases, even Children's Aid Society cases. I'm even allowed to use a recording device. But I see this all the time. But this is what's going, what the judges are doing. These are just some images from the public realm. This is what the public is starting to think and, and, and believe about the administration of justice in this country. A little girl there, you know, this is put up by some organization. How am I running, uh, Tella? Okay, so I'm doing okay here. So as I said, I've, every story I've talked to you about, I personally have met the people. Quite often I've met the children, I've met the uh, both sides, sometimes husbands and wives. I have a lot of these stories recorded on videotape. I have quite an extensive archive, especially of children's interviews. To back up what I say, so these have been my observations as someone who's been kind of in the trenches over the years. There is, there is a real problem. Now, based on my experience, these are a few suggestions that, uh, that our organization kind of supports. First of all, the, the biggest thing is that we've got to put an end to the, um, an end to this gender bias in the court system, okay? And promoting of this bias by special interest groups, okay? And this is a problem. One of the issues I've uh, heard about is that the judges get special training in Canada. They get training by some of the women's groups. Yet, this type of information is not available to public scrutiny. It's not open to uh, uh, freedom of information. So nobody knows what these judges are being told in the secrecy of these private training sessions. So a lot of this stuff is being uh, you know, passed on and, and uh, to other people and this whole industry is perpetuating itself by, with these myths and with these stereotypes. And, and as I said, I've got three girls. I've got three children, they're all girls. And you know, I would say, well, what have I got to worry about? My, kids are good. my, my children are gonna be an advantage but I've got a grandson, and I certainly don't want 20 years from now to be sitting here trying to help my grandson as an advocate when I know today there is a very serious problem. Um, police, one of the things I, one thing that we strongly believe in today is that police should be required to wear body-mounted video recording equipment. It is cheap, it doesn't cost them any extra money, it is clearly showing that it would stop a lot of these uh, allegations and clearly show what some of these uh, domestic violence situations are like. And to give you an example, I was involved just last year with, a, with the RCMP and was asked to conduct an investigation and write a report on two officers with the Halton Regional Police. I was provided by a member of the RCMP, I was provided the officer's notes and I was provided with audio recordings of secret audio recordings taken of the two police officers that were taken covertly of the two police officers, including telephone calls. I was asked to review 
the recorded information that had been secretly taken of the officers themselves, the uniformed officers, and I was asked to submit a report to the RCMP in Ottawa. And all I can say is I did a forensic examination of these, these tapes. I interviewed children that were involved at the time, and without a doubt, the officers who were involved lied through their teeth. The tape recordings revealed it, and they lied to make the person that they were talking to, to make that person look bad because there was a family court matter going on. And his ex, this person's ex-wife had called the police, said that she had been threatened when she dropped the kids off. Well, I spoke to the kids. They told me it was the mother that was abusive. She just happened to have friends who were on the police force who did some favors. So this kind of stuff is going on. I think there's another exam example that Attila knows. And, and uh, there is a chap outside of Newmarket. His wife was having an affair with a police officer in the local force. One day he had an allegation made against him. It wasn't too long ago. Yeah, it might have been just a couple years ago, I think. But she made an allegation. And I guess, now he didn't know she was having an affair, but guess who showed up at the house to arrest him? It was the mother's lover. He didn't know that. He just thought, here's an allegation. I'm being arrested, thrown in the can for a number of days. And it was the same officer who mother was having an affair with. And, uh, and in that case, uh, and again, I, my memory is a little bit lost. I'm not sure if it was in that case, but with the same police force, uh, we were involved where we had a private investigator follow the woman. And the private investigator tailed the car out to a remote, and the report said to a remote place you know, in northern Newmarket, where the, the, uh, the, the two subjects, the male and the female, suddenly their, their heads disappeared below the seats and they're on some remote, you know, uh, country road where there's very little traffic traveling. Well, the, the private investigator did a license check on the vehicle and guess who the vehicle belonged to? It was, to an, it, was, it, it was an undercover vehicle with the York Regional Police. So these kind of things are, are going on today. Now, this gentleman that I was talking about, that Attila knows, uh, was able to gather the evidence. There was, I believe, a lawsuit launched, and there was a, a substantial payout. And what was... Uh, also interesting in that case is like that first case I talked about earlier is that the mother there too absconded with the children to another part of Canada out to the East Coast. He couldn't find his kids either. He got a court order from the court to find and apprehend his children. He went to the police station where his wife was having an affair with, of course, he didn't know that the officer was there. He went to the police station to say, find my kids. Here's an order from the court. Bring my kids back. I'm sorry, sir, we don't know where your kids are. We can't find them. With all the resources that the police agency had at its disposal, they claimed that they could not find this mother and his children in spite of a court order. When he launched the lawsuit and uh, went through and was able to have some records, he found out that the police knew all the time where she was. In fact, the, she'd even become pregnant from the police officer who she was having an affair with. He was able to find out in, 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 uh, through a fluke where his kids were 
that was after I think maybe two or three years, four years. Police knew all the time where his kids were. They didn't want to help him. So these kind of things are, 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 clearly, are clearly wrong. Um, but, what, but getting back to the issue of what should we do? In general, we've got to stop this gender bias that's, that's clearly going on. Uh, and there's got to be procedures which restore justice, not try to create a, a, a I guess, a, a sense of this zero tolerance. And that's what it is. Zero tolerance is no tolerance. And that's what's going on today. Here's some specific recommendations. When there is a domestic violence incident where there is no physical abuse, a couple have just yelled at each other, maybe even threatened to kill each other, which couples sometimes do, there should be an automatic cooling down period, say 48 hours. The couple should be required to go to a mandatory course to say, okay, you've called police, we've come to your house, you get one strike, you attend this course and you're going to be told what is going to happen next time around. So that the couple understand what are the consequences. Rather than the police just showing up and uh, uh, just as that woman said in her letter, she thought she'd call 911 to teach him a lesson. So there should be a cooling down period and at the end of that cooling down period, mandatory course, teach the parents to say next time we come there will be an arrest. You guys better get your act together, understand. Now you're going to have people informed before they, before they act. Basically, tr uh, training, for, especially for Crown attorneys, we've got to get up, them out of this uh, notion that they're there to convict. Where they're there for justice. Where they're there to promote the administration of justice for Canadians. They're not there to put feathers in their cap by getting as many um, convictions as they can, which seems to be what they try to do now. If you want to be a good Crown Attorney, get the highest percentage of convictions as possible and maybe you'll get a job with some high paying uh, law firm. Maybe that's the way they think. Got about five minutes for Yeah, okay. That's just a uh, quick picture. I thought if anyone hasn't seen police uh, video surveillance stuff, they've got badges now that the police wear. It's a badge, a little video camera on top. So it has the officer's name. Equipment that can be easily and it's no costly than what they're using now. The failure of the, of the, of the system right now is, is causing children and families to lose respect for the system. And, and I'll give you a, you know, we've, in recent months, there's been some of these mass killings in the US, you know, where the kids are going into schools and, and uh, killing people, killing students. You're getting these rampages in the states uh, using guns, and you know what? The question is, why are these people doing this? What, why are these kids doing this, these young people? And I'll tell you right now, I know the boy that do, did this drawing. I've met with him. I know him. I know the abuse that he was uh, being subjected to by his mother. Look at the slogan on his shirt. It says, kill mom. I spoke to his sibling. Describe the abuse. This boy went to the police. He went to the Children's Aid Society. I tried to help as an advocate. They never took him out of the care of the mother, and he was abused for many years afterwards. One police officer I spoke to said, look, <clears throat> we get into a lot of trouble if we charge mothers with anything. Imagine what's going in the mind of this young boy. And I've spoken recently to his sibling. He's an extremely troubled young adult today. Nobody listened to him. The police failed him. The Children's Aid Society failed him. All these services 
that failed, that failed him said, well, it's his mother abusing it. We really, it's hard for us to do anything about it. And this is so terribly wrong. And this is a picture that is the inside of a young man's mind. And I'll tell you, that is a scary, scary picture. I think one, mother, one more slide I've got, again, it's just, it talks about, this is the type of thing when Children's Aid Society gets involved. Friends of children can't even see their own friends. When Children's Aid get involved, they separate the family, they force the mother away, they basically isolate the children from even their friends. And yes, I spoke to these kids. I even spoke and interviewed, I have the children who they're talking about on these signs, I interviewed them personally. The children had to secretly, who, who were the ones that they're talking about here, had to arrange to secretly meet with me to describe how nobody was listening to them, how much abuse they were sub being subjected to, and how they were terrified of the workers from the Children's Aid Society and from the police because nobody would listen to them. Friends of their mother arranged to bring the kids to, for me to secretly interview on video. And of course, once I got the video, things changed pretty quickly after that, <laughs> once they knew they could not silence a kid. So that's, I think, the end of my, I guess, one hour. So anyways, that's been my, just a tip of the iceberg of the experiences I've had personally in this movement. So hopefully that everyone will learn a little bit off that. So thank you very much.